Good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan Fisher, and today I have the pleasure of sharing with you the photography of Robert K. Dowler. Along with being a clever photographer, Bob was an avid modeler and a railroad artist. Here's Bob's original painting of Milwaukee E11 at Harlowtown. Starting in the late 1940s, Bob photographed lots of interesting trains in Spokane and around the Inland Empire. Bob's favorite subject was the Milwaukee Road, but he also took pictures of the NP, GN, UP, and SPNS, and eventually the BN. Bob's pictures have not been seen publicly for many, many years. Today, we are looking at a sample of Bob's Milwaukee Road photography. Cascade Rail Foundation and the Pacific Northwest Railroad Archive are the online resource to view these images in the future. Bob also took a few movies. Hopefully the digitalization of Bob's movies will be complete in the next couple of months. Stay tuned for our next episode as these movies might be really good. Bob was my friend and mentor. We met in 1971, almost exactly 50 years ago at the Whatcom Railroad Association, a model railroad club in Bellingham, Washington. We instantly bonded as we were both Milwaukee Road fans. Taking train pictures with Bob was a lot of fun. Here's a picture of one of Bob's friends on a trip to Avery. Bob had a charming sense of humor that kept us in stitches all day long. We stayed in touch even after the family moved back to Spokane in 1972. I have lots of fond memories of trips to visit Bob and the family in Spokane in the 1970s. Bob and I lost track of each other from the early 1980s to the mid 1990s. That changed when I saw a question by Robert Dowler of Spokane, Washington in the Milwaukee Railroader. I thought, there's a chance that this could be my long lost friend. So I called directory assistant and they gave me Bob's phone number. I called Bob out of the blue. Turns out I was the second happiest guy on that call and Bob and I remained close from then on. Our presentation starts with getting to know Bob and the Dowler family. From there, we'll look at some of Bob's early photography, starting with some timeless photos of Spokane, Washington. We'll take a, a break partway through today's presentation, as Paul mentioned. During our break, I'll have a Milwaukee Road rolling stock puzzler for your consideration. Submit your questions or solutions. Any input is welcome. We'll also be doing some Q&A during the break. I'm going to stay with the group, and, and hopefully that'll be a good time for us. After the break, our presentation continues with a look at more of Bob's photography in the early 1970s. Bob's photography was a family effort. Our presentation today would not be possible without the substantial assistance of the Dowler family. Special thanks to Norm Hochwalter and to Gary and Jim Dowler and the entire Dowler family for making Bob's photos available for our viewing today. Thank you to Paul Kruger. Oh, here's the picture that we're gonna have for the puzzler. There we go. Thanks to Paul Kruger at Cascade Rail Foundation for hosting today's event and making it possible to share these timeless images by Bob Dollar of the Milwaukee Road with you. Many thanks to Dale Sanders, Jay Letzner, and to Mill Clark for their technical assistance. And a special thanks to Gary Tarbox at PNRA for his support. Sit back and enjoy today's presentation. Thanks again for watching. So we're gonna start out with some family photos. Now, Bob Dowler shows up in one of the very first pictures that I ever took with a camera. Here's a picture of the first Amtrak train arriving in Bellingham, Washington in the summer of 1971. And true to form, I've got a great picture of Bob, Bob's, the back of Bob's head, that is. So, and some other people that we knew back in the day. And, and I think this was the first time that we ever saw a Burlington unit. Here's another picture of the back of Bob's head. It seems like that was all I was really ever able to do. 
This is at St. Mary's, Idaho. This was a string of box cabs that were moving west from Avery to the coast to be dismantled and they bad ordered them at St. Mary's. So we spent the day kind of taking a look at them there. And here's another picture of the back of Bob's head. Seems like that's all I could ever really do. This shot being next to the engine house at Avery, Idaho. Being a really good photographer, the disadvantage of course, is that you're never in your pictures. So here's a picture of Carol Dowler and the kids in 1969, looking at the centennial train that the Union Pacific had in Spokane, Washington as part of the 100th anniversary of the gold spike in 1969. Here's another picture of the same family on July 4th of 1974 at the Lake Whatcom Steam Railway near Bellingham, Washington. And here are the boys, a couple of the boys in Spokane on August 14th, 1975, when Delaware and Hudson number 18 was spotted in the Union Pacific Yard in Spokane. So one of the really exciting things in working with the family collection of photographs was being able to find a picture of the front of Bob. And we were able to do that. This is a picture of Bob Dowler taken in the summer of 1950. So he would be a senior in high school in this photograph. So I was very pleased to find this picture. From here, Bob went on to serve in the US Navy. And here we have a picture of JNR 8205 at the Yakasuka Naval Station in Japan in 1953. Later on, here's a picture of Bob in his uniform and, and Carol Dowler, Bob's wife. You know, Bob, in many ways, was my train dad. And that would mean that in many ways, Carol would be my train mom. You know, speaking of the family effort, a lot of the pictures we would have taken and we did take and the fun that we had, you know, Carol was behind us in doing that. And she made it possible for us to go out and have these adventures. And I think frankly, she liked trains just as much as Bob did. Here is the only picture that I've seen up till now of a photograph of Bob's that actually made it into a book or publication. This particular picture was in the Walter Grand book on the SPNS a number of years ago. And it also appeared in a very good book uh, by Thomas Hillebrand, Palouse Rails. And, and that caption, the, the grand book listed this as Robert Dollar Photography Made in Reichard Collection. The uh, Thomas Hillebrand book listed it as a PNRA collection. So that meant the picture was at PNRA. So I went out there and, and did some researching just recently, like I think last week to be able to have this picture available for us to look at today. And we called Rich, who is an expert on the SPNS, and he says, well, I don't have either of those books, but what's it a picture of? And I says, well, it's a couple of FAs heading towards Spokane, and there's a woman standing at the bottom of a dirt road. Three minutes later, he calls us back, and he says, it's image number, blah, 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 blah. And of course, he was absolutely correct. And thank you, Rich, for, for helping us find this picture so that I can share it with the group today. Interestingly, I showed this picture to a friend of ours who we'll meet in a minute. And the first words out of his mouth was, that's Carol Dowler at the bottom of the hill. So this would be in the late 1950s and at Scribner. So I went over a couple of weeks ago and visited Gary Dowler. Here's Gary. And we, needed, we did a couple of different things that day. One of the things we did for a moment was we stopped by the Hilliard Heritage Museum near where the old Great Northern Yard was in Hilliard. And interestingly, we got photobombed by Rocky, uh, the Great Northern Goat. And this is a reflection of Rocky off of a boxcar that's sitting over on the other side of the display. Here's Gary and the fellow on the left is Norm Hockhalter. Norm was a super gracious guy and allowed me access to a number of Bob's really, really great pictures that we're gonna be able to look at today. But I just wanna take a minute and share with you what a great guy Norm is and what a talented fellow he was during his working career. Norm in his later years 
was a professional model builder and he would travel around the country constructing models of oil rigs and petroleum plants and all kinds of interesting stuff. But the, the model that I thought would be most interesting to this group today was one that Norm and his dad built over about a five year period of time. The Great Northern Depot in Spokane, Washington in O-Scale. It, like I say, it took him and his dad, I think five years where they took a break in the middle just because it was such a daunting project. The tower is 42 inches high and the clocks all work on all four sides, but Norm tells me that they don't keep the same time. So Gary Dowler, Bob's son on the right, is also an extremely talented fellow as well. And Gary drew this, a drawing at Harlowtown, Montana of E70. This is a pencil drawing and deservedly this won first prize at the Spokane County Fair. Gary was also intimately involved in the preparation of Bob's marker at the cemetery. We now know that Bob's locomotive was number, favorite locomotive was number 132 of 464. And we can see November 20th, 1932 to November 25th, 2005. So I guess I'd have to say that my friend Bob is an eternal Milwaukee Road fan. Bob got a Rolly cord camera in the late 1940s. And so we're gonna start taking a look at some of the pictures that he took around the Spokane area now. Starting out with this RPO baggage car seen on the Milwaukee Road right away in Spokane in December, 1948. So I think this would be pretty close to some of the very first pictures that Bob took. Being an avid modeler and a very good modeler at that, Bob was always interested in the intricate details of freight cars. Now, I have seen a few train pictures in my years, but I have not seen many freight cars that look like this. This looks like it, it's described as an auto box in detail. And so apparently these doors would open and you could potentially drive an automobile into this piece of passenger equipment. Here is the Spokane engine house in the late 19, mid to late 1950s. Um, it's no longer in service in this photograph as the operation had moved out to East Spokane by then. But we're gonna see some pictures of this thing in service here in just a second. Here is Milwaukee road number 52, seen under steam at that very same engine terminal in June, 1950. And its friend, the 57, also seen in May of 1950 at the same engine terminal. I believe that this is along Trent. All of this area was gone before, long gone before I ever made it to Spokane. So my knowledge of this area is limited to the photographs that we're sharing today. Here's the 835 and the 855 at that aforementioned engine house on a summer day in June of 1950. And I think that that uh, in detail of that kind of interesting passenger slash freight car that we saw would be up on one of these tracks back in here is where I'm, I think that that would be. Here is a copy of a timetable that I got from PNRA. And I just wanted to just share with you a couple things. July of 1950, and passenger train number 18 would leave Spokane at 8 a.m. for Manitou, about 30 miles an hour between Spokane and Manitou. And, and at 8.40 with an arrival at Plummer at 9.10. So it was a, sort of a perfect passenger train for the morning light. And I also thought it was interesting that the speed limit for this train was 70 miles an hour once it got onto Milwaukee Road track. So here is Milwaukee Road number 131 leading that train eastbound in the morning, having just left Spokane Union Station. The engine terminal again is just off to the left. 849, a Milwaukee Road, I'm not quite sure what the configuration of it is, is seen in December, 1948. So again, this would be in one of Bob's very, very first photographs. 
Here's the 250, April of 1949, proceeding eastbound. We can see the Great Northern Depot in the background. 1405, a switch engine seen in July of 1949. Um, this area was obviously a popular area. I think that some people have told me it was called the trench. Um, it's certainly a nice place to, to have watched trains and I'm sad that I didn't get the chance to see some trains here myself. Here's the 853 in August of 1949, again, leading that eastbound morning passenger train through the tent. We can see Berg's Tent Factory, which is a common sighting in a number of these photographs. There's a little overpass here and there's a little overpass there. And there's somebody's arm in the picture here, but I'm not quite sure who's. Here's the 1481 running light in the yard. And, um, you know, it looks like it's sort of set up for a bi-directional operation with the headlight on the tail end and, you know, off we go. The 1491 with, I believe it's the 263, again, with Berg's, Berg's tent factory. Both locomotives are under steam. And so I'm not quite sure what the nature of the switching operation that Bob captured was, but it's certainly an interesting sight these days. Here's the 263. Now this is in West Spokane. So this would be approaching Union Station. And I believe the Union Pacific Yard in West Spokane is just off to the left of where the train is seen. And even in summer, June of 1950, we still have white smoke in the morning, which makes for a lovely train and lovely piece of equipment. Here's the 131 in June of 1950, again, proceeding eastbound, this time towards Union Station with that morning passenger train. The 851 on June 20th, 1951, is seen at the engine terminal in the trench in downtown Spokane. In June, July 1950, we see the 889 proceeding eastbound at a pretty good pace, uh, you know, to where he blurs for action, but the rest of the picture is sharp. So uh, proceeding eastbound uh, with white smoke and uh, a lovely scene. This area, I believe, has all been filled in. I think this all sort of became Expo in here, Expo 74. The 269 is seen leading the passenger, passenger train eastbound again in July of 1950. The Union Pacific also used this trackage for their trains. Now, here is uh, Union Pacific 1182, train 67. Here's the Great Northern Tower in the background. So it's marching along at a, at a pretty high rate of speed. It must be accelerating as that Alco is exuding a fair amount of smoke on its own. And in August of 1949, excuse me, April of 1949, we have Union Pacific 3223 leading train 67 along that trench as well. And again, proceeding at a pretty good rate of speed. It says on the sleeve that this is train 67, but as far as I can tell, it's a light power move of Union Pacific 3226 in West Spokane. This was trackage that the Milwaukee Road and the Union Pacific shared. The Milwaukee running from Marengo, Washington to Spokane and then down to Manitou, where it then crossed back onto its own track and proceeded along the route from there. Here's a picture of 267 on train 18 at Chester, Washington in May of 1954. You know, a couple things we want to think about here. First, the train is proceeding at a high rate of speed because this was 70 mile an hour track. Second, this is probably, could possibly be the one of the last shots of a steam locomotive on this passenger train because 1954, I think was sort of the end of steam operation on the coast for the Milwaukee Road. Let's look at a few diesels. 
1650, seen in that trench engine terminal in December 1948. So again, one of Bob's most early photographs and in kind of an atmospheric, kind of a, a neat picture. So I've tried to do the best I can to scan these in to make them available, but I'm gonna tell you that I'm not the greatest photo editor. So I think someone with a little more photo editing talent could take a photo like this and really make it pop for us. But my goal today was to try to show as much of Bob's Milwaukee Road collection and try not to focus on trying to make each image perfect because I'd still be on image number two. Here's the 1700 in July of 1949, again at that engine terminal. It's kind of a neat place, you know, I wish now that I'd had a chance to, like I said before, be able to visit a, a location like this. It looks like they're doing some sort of mechanical work. I can see like, it looks like a fan blade here and some other various and sundry parts. And I see that they have the doors off. So apparently not all is well in the world, but the 1700 and this particular moment in time. Doesn't get much more atmospheric than this in my estimation. I mean, here we have the 2204, a brand new Milwaukee Road SD with the 665 over here, still under steam at this engine terminal in the trench. And, I, and again, that, that car that we looked at first off, I, you know, it looks like to me, I mean, this might even be it right there. There's so much neat stuff. I mean, you know, film was so expensive back then, you know, it's a shame that you couldn't have taken pictures of more stuff. So here now on July 29th, 1954, versus the May 1954 that we saw with the steam engine, here we see brand new Milwaukee Road passenger Jeeps leading train 18 in East Spokane. So by this point in time, the transition from steam to diesel has been completed for this train for the Milwaukee Road. Here that train again is also seen in East Spokane. This picture is, it looks like it's also in 1954. And again, here's the 2428 and the 2426, a pair of Milwaukee Road passenger Jeeps leading train 18 eastbound in the morning in East Spokane. It's a very cool picture, you know, with the clouds in the background. It's one of those things where the, you had that little window of sun where you could kind of nail a shot like this. And I think that's a pretty neat picture myself. Back in East Spokane, we've got a pair of freight Jeeps switching in the yard, 2411, and I believe 2418 is the other one if memory serves. 2422 and 2415, pair of freight Jeeps, again, are seen switching in East Spokane, and I have the date on that as July 29th, 1954. Bob was really good about documenting information on his pictures and I'm gonna, for those of you that can see my face on the screen, I'm just gonna take a second and hold one of these up to the camera. So every one of his pictures comes in a little sleeve like that of the black and whites and they're all labeled as to what they were and he was quite good. You know, it would be Milwaukee Road 802 rail detector, Deer Lodge, Montana, uh, September, 1956, et cetera, et cetera. So there's quite a bit of data that Bob has given us that needs to be cataloged with these images so that the future viewers of these will have the full experience of all the data that he's making available for us. The 2211, another one of these beautiful uh, Milwaukee Road SDs with the full Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul and Pacific logo. And interestingly, this locomotive has the full fuel tank. Some of them didn't. And we'll see some of the ones that didn't have that full fuel tank as we proceed along in our presentation. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho was served by the Milwaukee Road. And the 1614 is seen here at the Milwaukee Road Freight House in this atmospheric photograph from December, 1955. So in December, 1955, I was six weeks old. So it's really neat to be able to look and see what was going on in the world 
during that that uh, that time. So that's a cool shot. This is also, I thought, a very interesting shot that he had. And this one, I think I might like the best just because you can kind of see the town and you can kind of see the cars and it just has a lot of really sort of neat elements that that make it fun for us to look at today for those of us that have some vague recollection of the 1950s. It's a Milwaukee Road presentation, but sometimes I just can't help myself and I have to include a Union Pacific picture. In this case, in May of 1950, the M98 motor car and UP 1182 are seen at the West Spokane roundhouse and shops of the Union Pacific Railroad. This area, of course, has all been changed around substantially and was gone before I ever got here in the early 1970s. Here's a picture from my collection of a pen and ink drawing of Union Station in Spokane, Washington. Uh, there was a substantial effort by a number of individuals in Spokane to try to preserve these depots to be used in conjunction with Expo 74. But um, for whatever reason, that did not turn out to be the case. So sadly for many of us, this is about all we're left with for memories of what Union Station looked like. And the reason I bring this photo up is because Bob got out there in 1973 and took a picture. This is of the other side of the building. But this is a very important photograph as this image was only available for a very, very short period of time. And we're gonna take one more look here. So the reason that it was only available for a very limited period of time is because in the foreground stood the Great Northern Depot. So you would not be able to see the Milwaukee Road Depot because there was a platform there and the Great Northern Depot. And of course, this iconic symbol of Spokane was called back then, Bob called it the Expo Rocket. And fortunately, there was some remnant of the depot left, but I think I'd rather have Norm Hockwalter's version than the tower. So anyway, I believe, yes, that wraps up our, our section on Spokane. And now we're going to jump ahead to a place that is popular with lots of people, Avery, Idaho. So we have a few pictures of that Bob took in early 1951 at Avery, Idaho. And we're sort of working through Bob's photos in a chronological fashion. So these are the original scheme F units in a trio. And when we look back then, we see a lot of refrigerated cars. And so I think that uh, transportation of, of produce and food back and forth from the Northwest to centers in the Midwest was a substantial source of income for the railroad back in those days. You've got the substation and the depot, which also included a, a diner, which was a, a popular place as we'll see. The St. Joe River here, it looks like it's got plenty of water on this occasion. Looking across the river on the same day, we see a set, a matched set of box cabs in the old green paint. And unfortunately, they're too far away for us to be able to make out what the road number of them is. But Bob was able to get a picture of them in the in the green paint and, and here that photograph is. Again, looking across the river. Now in this picture, I just want to point out there is a little Joe sitting right here. And that I believe is this little Joe right there. Okay, and we've got a couple of more uh, uh, little Joes at the roundhouse and engine terminal. Um, there was a fire, as I recall, early in the Milwaukee Road years at Avery, and we can see remnants of the forest that was there probably pre-fire. This is a very interesting photograph, I think, for a number of reasons. First, you know, how many people go to Avery, Idaho and take pictures of steam? So I thought that that was pretty cool. And we can see the operation of the roundhouse going on here and a couple of steam locomotives. But what's interesting to me is this. 
it looks like that there is a residence here with a white picket fence and a car. So I'm assuming that this must have been some uh, uh, a Milwaukee Road employee's home that they had to work on the railroad. And here we go. And here's a close-up shot of those steam engines. So we're going to get an even closer shot of these here in a couple of minutes. It's very, very cool. And so the reason that I thought that that house was interesting is here, this person has a victory garden or the 1950s equivalent of a victory garden as seen in the foreground of the 1211. And I believe that these were all still operational in these pictures in 1951. They're not just parked here. Here again is another shot of the 1211. And the 849. You know, on the Milwaukee Road, as we'll see in this presentation, the same locomotives show up over and over and over again. And another shot of the 849 next to the roundhouse. We'll see in years to come and later in this presentation how this area has changed around substantially from 1950 to 1970. And here, Bob got a picture of the 250 under steam running through the yard at Avery. So I you know, wonder if this could have been the arriving power for train 18 that then was switched to electrics for the trip east from there. Now we're on to our first visit to Othello, Washington. This visit was in May of 1954. You know, and we use this picture as one of the cover pictures for today's presentation, just simply because it was such a neat picture. It's got so many great photographic elements. Uh, we've got the depot here in the distance. We've got the E3 bipolar. We've got the string of cabooses. We've got the sand tower. And we've got these two structures right here. And, and so, you know, please post a comment. I see we're getting some comments. Please post a comment regarding what these structures are. Um, we're going to get a closer look at one of them here in a second. Here again, the E3 can be seen with the cabooses in the background and this just kind of really classic timeless photograph. The 0700 caboose with an offset bay window and I believe those are arch bar trucks underneath them. And of course the E3, not under power, both pantographs are down. This is that little structure that I was talking to you about earlier. Um, Bob's note had a comment that it was used, somehow was steam engines used this in some fashion. And I'm not, I'm just not sure enough to be able to say with any certainty in this presentation of what that was. So if we know what this is, by all means, let, let me know, I'm, I'm curious. Here's the E1, a bipolar in Othello on that occasion in, in May of 1954. And the E3, we've seen a couple of pictures of it. Here it is, adjacent to those caboose tracks again. And another close up picture of it. Beautiful looking piece of equipment. I believe one of them got preserved. in a final picture of the E3. This time we got a pantograph up, so something must be going on as this thing must be getting ready to do something somewhere. I think Bob and, and his, uh, his gang, which could include Norm Hockhalter and uh, Ted Holloway and maybe Jerry Quinn, were down here photographing Northern Pacific steam and Bob probably talked him into taking a side trip over to Othello just to see what was going on because there's a number of steam images right from this period of time over on the NP, which we're not going to get into looking at today. Uh, and uh, Bob, of course, being a good freight car spotter, and in this case, a passenger car spotter, a maintenance of the way service, got this great picture of the X554, which looks to be a maybe an RPO baggage combine of some sort, obviously in maintenance of the way service, and also riding on freight trucks now. So, you know, it's been downsized, but he always had a very good eye 
for capturing these nuances that were so important that when we look back at today are just simply timeless. In January of 1955, Bob took a trip on train number 18 from Spokane to Missoula, Montana. And he, Bob was able to take some pictures out the train window of the train as it worked its way up the pass. And, and these are, you know, you think about it, you're on a bouncing train, you've got slow speed film, you're probably shooting at, you know, 250 max, probably 125th, trying to hold your camera still and capture a picture. And I would have to say that, as usual, Bob has done pretty well. Again, here's another picture of that bridge. I've done the best I can, and I'm going to mention this now. I'll mention it again. There are no numbers on these images, and they're all individual. And so when you try to get things back into the proper order, you know, sometimes it's just this one first or is this one first. So I've done the best I can with territory that I've not seen personally. So accept my apologies if I've got one out of order. Here's another picture. Now they've come around the loop and are working their way up to, to the tunnel. And we can see the, uh, the trestles down below. Here's a great picture of the whole scene that Bob was able to capture from the train. And here we are up at the summit. So I'm assuming here that he was able to open the upper half of the vestibule door and get a couple of pictures looking out the window. We can see here at East Portal that it's an absolutely delightful day, January 12th, 1955. And the advantage of, you know, having a house right next to the substation is you don't have to drive to work. All you have to do is be able to climb over the snow drifts and, and there you go. So this was the residence of the people that worked to keep the substation going. Atmospheric shot if there ever was one. Bob did get a picture inside the train as well. And there's a number of nuances here that I think are worth taking a look at. The tasteful sort of, um, the, the term escapes me, uh, the soft lighting. Um, I believe this is a Sansevieria houseplant and a very sort of cool period um, interior picture. You know, the only, sort of the only bad part about this picture, of course, is the lack of patronage. There's not a soul here to be seen except for Bob taking this picture. Bob got to Missoula and got off the train. So in this particular case, the train was led by E3, which is a bipolar. Now I'm not a, as expert as many people are on the Milwaukee road, but I, my understanding was that these were out on the coast and not necessarily in operation on the Rocky Mountain Division. So all I can say is we were lucky to be able to get a picture of a bipolar in this situation. And I think that this is such a classic shot. You know, you've got this detail from the railing, the person in the distance, the depot in the middle of it. It's just a really cool picture in my mind. And here we have a maintenance person reviewing the condition of the locomotive before it continues to proceed eastbound. And a picture from the, I believe this is the bridge over the river where Bob was standing to take this picture of the Milwaukee Road Depot in Missoula, Montana, near, I believe near the University of Montana campus where my wife graduated from college. It's a great picture of the depot. We've got the vintage cars in the parking lot and uh, um, it's just a lovely, lovely image. This building, I believe, is still standing. And Bob got a couple of little Joes in the snow leading an eastbound freight past that very same depot. So, so that's pretty cool. So one of the things, you know, Bob would, all the electrics would go in one section and all the diesels would go in another section and all the right-of-way pictures would go in another section and and they were sort of filed functionally and so when we try to reunite these pictures in sort of a sequence you know i've pulled from several different locations to be able to sort of reconstruct what's what went on on this trip 
you know, I'm going to include a couple of pictures here just because it was sort of, it was a challenge to figure out that these pictures that I'm going to show you were part of the same trip. But Bob went across the river and went into the Northern Pacific Depot in Missoula and got a couple of pictures of some of the locomotives in there. And I think that these are pretty, I know they're NP, but I think that they're pretty neat and worth including because it was part of the same adventure for Bob. So let's see how we're doing. We're chugging along. Bob went to Seattle, Washington on March 27th, 1955 as part of a longer trip. And we'll talk about the trip just in passing, just because it was so interesting. And here we have the train in Seattle. And I'm not sure if this is 16 or 18 or, you know, not sure which train it is. Um, but he got a good picture of the box cabs. And this one is that modified box cab. It's got a little bit of uh, customization to make it look a little bit nicer. And of course, the Olymp Olympian Hiawatha uh, Skytop Lounge, which was always popular with Milwaukee Road fans. And a picture of the E23. Uh, I think that they're running around their train with the city of Seattle in the background, King Street Station and Smith Tower. And of course, the rest of the background, you wouldn't, you wouldn't recognize it today. That's for sure. It doesn't look like this anymore. Bob got a picture of one of the Superdomes. Um, those are very neat cars riding on six axle trucks. And of course, this vehicle shows up in all of these pictures and it's just kind of a cool looking, it looks like a Chevrolet. Here's a picture of the box cabs coupled onto the back of the Skytop Lounge and in Milwaukee Road folks, if you could remind me, it seemed like to me that they pulled backwards out to Black River Junction and then ran around the train and proceeded eastbound. You can fill me in on the details. So it certainly kind of looks like they're leaving Long End first as, as it were. And here's the entire train at the depot. This, these are morning shots. This whole area where the train is sitting now has all been replaced with, with an office building, 505 Union, which was uh, the office building for a company called Vulcan, which was owned by the, a guy named Paul Allen. Here we are, we're gonna keep going. Here we are for our second visit on Othello in December of 1955. Again, a real atmospheric setting where Bob has got all sorts of neat elements of, of art and photography and interest in history here for us to absorb. A pair of a trio of freight Jeeps, some box cabs in the distance, that sand tower, and of course, way off in the distance, the depot. Here's a close up of that trio of freight units. So presumably this would be the power that would lead a train through the gap between Othello and Avery, or potentially up to Spokane, depending on how the routing of this particular train went. You know, just simple play, simple pictures by Bob can be so informative and so atmospheric. You know, a string of ribside boxcars, the water tank, the wire, you know, just a sort of quintessential Othello. And of course we go to Othello now and this is just all just dirt and weeds. The E50, which was the power that we saw here in the distance, here that is, and again, and again. Very nice, it's a two unit box cab. And again, they're two units, three units, four units. I'm not the, the person qualified to give you the breakdown on how all that worked. We're at our first visit to Deer Lodge. We're only a couple of minutes away from our break. So, you know, just to let you know, this isn't gonna go on forever. And we'll be taking a break here in a couple of minutes. We're gonna look at the Deer Lodge shots, and then we're gonna look at the puzzler, and then we're gonna do some Q and A for a couple of minutes. So here's our first visit to Deer Lodge. And this is a, a crew change. I've been to Deer Lodge, but of course, not during 
not when it was like this where it was really cool so um looks like a crew change here we are this is the e71 it's got its pantographs up so it's ready for action and another picture of the e71 i believe these were in the late afternoon it looks like to me my geography works out properly and the 73 again these are all um not ready to go because all the pantographs are down in here again we have our maintenance person with this little oil can here going around and servicing the locomotive making sure it's ready to go just i remember when i rode on a little joe and the engineer said you know if they would just take care of these things just a little bit they'd last forever and here he is again checking the locomotive and bob being you know dutiful to history captures a moment with a maintenance person working on the locomotive which in some ways makes it more interesting here's an atmospheric picture of deer lodge in later years box cabs steeple cabs little joes and the steam rotary over here which we'll look at in more detail later the b end of a little joe they originally came with cabs in both ends and for some reason they discontinued the cab at, at the what they call now the b end of the of the locomotive so every time it needed to go in a different direction you had to turn it deer lodge had these really cool steeple cab switchers and we're going to see a couple pictures of these here in a second like this one this is a really great picture. The engineer, he's smiling for the camera. You know, these days when, it, when they see you taking a picture of the train, they're like hiding their face or they're, you know, they don't want you to take their picture or whatever. This fella, he was on board with the idea. He says, oh yeah, here I am. Let me smile for you as this E80 switches away. And here it is again. And you'll notice we've got all of this you know, refrigerated traffic. So this looks like, you know, I would think that those are pretty high value merchandise cars and are probably a pretty good revenue source for the railroad in those days. Here he is again, all smiles, still driving his locomotive. What a great looking little piece of equipment. And here's the E81 with the E21 next to it. I could look at this picture for a while. The 82, the 21, and the 81 at Deer Lodge on sort of a cloudy afternoon, sort of an atmospheric afternoon, if you would. And here's the, so this is the four by six version of it, but actually Bob was a two by two camera or two and a quarter. So this is what the full frame of that kind of looks like. And the E82, again, in the yard at Deer Lodge, and again in the yard at Deer Lodge. The E, I believe that's the 27. Um, you know, they weren't big believers in putting big numbers on locomotives so that you could see them. I mean, you need to look in the right place to know what, what unit number this was. And here he is coupled onto his train. It looks like this is an eastbound getting ready to leave because I can see the town over here and the railroad was west of the town. And again, look at all this nice head end merchandise traffic. So hopefully, you know, that was uh, good revenue times for the railroad back then. Pictures of the Deer Lodge Depot that Bob took. You know, this depot is still standing, but it's, it's now a house of worship. A couple of interesting things I thought. First, it has a mailbox. Remember those? So that's kind of interesting. In here, now we have a 50-50. The operator either rode the motorcycle or drove the car. I'm not quite sure which. But the placement of the logo being horizontal with the lettering on an angle, you know, many times we see that that logo on an angle with the lettering horizontal. So that's sort of an unusual situation. And here's the far end of it. And one of the things that I learned from Bob that's I think very important is if you're going to build a model of a depot, you need to take a picture of the side that faces away from the tracks.
And so here Bob has done that because being a good modeler, you know, he probably had the goal of, of building a model of this in HO at some point in time, which he was more than capable of doing. He built some beautiful models and we're not gonna have time to look at those today, but there's definitely some neat stuff. So I think that this is Norm, who we saw earlier, scratching his head, wondering why someone would plunk a hole in the middle of a building like that. This is the old water tank at Deer Lodge in somewhat semi dissembled condition. The sand tower at Deer Lodge with a sand car. And here's an overall picture of what the yard in, in Deer Lodge kind of looked like. We can see that this water tank over here, the sand tower, some maintenance of the way equipment, the sand car, great stuff. Okay, so we're getting ready to take the break. So here we go. I'm gonna launch the freight car puzzler. There's four images here and then Paul will be on break for the next few minutes. I'll stay online. And all I'm gonna do is just stop presenting for probably about the next you know, couple minutes until Paul the dispatcher gives me the green light to get going again. So we have this car that Bob took a picture of in December of 1955, Milwaukee X543. This is an unusual piece of equipment in my, my estimation. And so on the sleeve that the, this particular image was in, Bob wrote on there that this was a silk car, S-I-L-K. And so then the question is, because we're not sure, so we're soliciting input from the audience, is this a silk car? We'll share the answers that, we, that we've found so far, which are not 100% conclusive here in a minute. Here's a picture of the end of the car and there's so much neat stuff. There's these little, I'm not quite sure what these are, like a vent, I guess. And then it looks like that these must have been glass at one point in time. And of course the rounded end, we'll look a little closer. Here's the truck detail. So a passenger truck of some sort. And here's an end shot of that piece of equipment in Othello. So at this point, I'm gonna just stop for a second, give my friend Paul a chance to dig through all the questions and comments. And then uh, based on uh, his direction, we'll resume our presentation here in a couple of minutes. I hope you've enjoyed what we've seen so far. Paul, take it away. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, great presentation so far. I hope everyone's enjoying it. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, discussion in the comments. Um, mostly commentary, but one question I saw that did not get answered was someone was asking, I think it was Colin was asking if these were large format black and white negatives that we're seeing. These are uh, two and a quarter inch black and white negatives. Uh, we'll also in the later half of our presentation be looking at two and a quarter inch color negatives. And other than a couple pictures by me that I just had to sneak in, every single picture here was taken by Bob and are made available to us courtesy of the Dollar family. Uh, one more question popped up uh, asking what a quill is. That was the very first locomotive that we saw that was Bob's painting. And those were, I believe, Baldwin Westinghouse locomotives that they were in passenger service that traditionally would serve the Rocky Mountain Division with the bipolar serving passenger service on the Coast Division. But I believe that the Baldwin Westinghouses were gone by the 1950s that believe they were original to the electrification and they just didn't last that long. But I remember Bob always thought that they were pretty neat. And so it's not a surprise to me to see that if he was going to paint an, a Milwaukee Road electric that he picked a quill to paint. I thought that that was, that's an important point, Paul. Um, we have a question asking if there's going to be any photos between Rathdrum, Idaho and Newport, Washington. No, sorry. Now, that would be on the old, um, on the line to uh, Medellin Falls. And we don't have anything there. You know, um, 
we've done the best working with the family. We've done the best we can to find as much of Bob's collection as we possibly can. And we've really made some great progress. But, you know, for example, we've got 140 images of Northern Pacific steam locomotives, but we only have two images of great Northern steam locomotives. So we think to ourselves, you know, there must be some more collection around amongst some of the other, some of the other of Bob's kids. And so we keep looking for this stuff. And the really great part of it is, Paul, is that when we find stuff, it's not the stuff that we're looking for. We find, keep finding new stuff that's more exciting and more interesting than what we had our minds on that we thought we were looking for. So it's just been a great adventure and, and it's been a lot of fun. Oh, this is Bob Butler. Sorry to interrupt this way. I can't get chat to work. But basically those structures as all were yeah. bufflers for the steam engine boiler blowdown. And I saw similar structures set for their concrete in service in China around the year 2001. Well, thank you very much for that information. And I kind of thought that that was the case, but I wasn't convicted enough to be able to make a statement of that in a meeting in front of a bunch of people. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, for helping me on that particular item. And, and if anybody else has got any more, you know, commentary like that, you know, I, 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 I'm just grateful that you're here and, and I'm hoping you're enjoying the presentation. So, yes, I am. Thank yeah. you. And uh, the baggage car. Yeah. Was probably used in branch line somewhere on the Milwaukee. Um, you have another comment that says that um, generally the silk cars were uh, double door longer. Uh, in fact, Roundhouse has a series out or used to have out a series of cars about the same configuration and length hmm. as the photo. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. So, you know, and, and of the images, I was convinced because three of the images said silk car, but the fourth image said silk car question mark. So then I was, wasn't a hundred percent sure as to what we have. So here's what we've come up with so far on the X543. Mr. Milk Clark of Missoula, Montana provided me this information about the car built in 1902 with a 36 foot length and steel wheels. These were two of these and they're called Milk Express steel underframe, formerly vegetable cars. So yeah, that yeah, might work, I'm not sure. And then of course, uh, my dear friend, Mr. Paul Kruger provided us with this drawing of a very similar looking car. The only thing that throws me off here is the length because this car shows to be 45 feet and I'm not sure that the picture of the car that we saw in Othello is quite that long, but certainly it has all of the other elements, the door, the, the, the detail up here, the spacing. These cars were built in 1882 and remodeled in 1905. So I think we can conclude that whatever the 543 was, was went into service in that form around the turn of the 20th century. And, you know, we were lucky that Bob was able to get a picture of it as late as 1955. So we're not going to take a look at very many of Bob's freight car pictures today. You know, I could do a two hour presentation just on Milwaukee Road cabooses with Bob's collection, but I do want to talk about this car for a moment. This was on our trip to Tacoma in May of 1972. This was before the family moved back to Spokane. And so here we are at the Milwaukee Road in Tacoma and it's a busy place. And this was their yard lead and blah, blah, blah. And they had these sort of these rip tracks out back by where the old passenger station, where the 1960s era passenger station was, 1950s era passenger station. And Bob saw this car, the X830. And it was like, 
it was this, it was like it was this old old girlfriend from like 40 years ago. And he was so excited to see this piece of equipment. And being the guy that he was, of course, he had two things in his pocket, a tape measure and a notebook. And so for the next hour, we measured all the windows, how big they were, what the spacing was, what the gaps were between them. And you know, like the modification here for some unknown purpose, post a comment, folks, if you know why this particular car had this, but this, when it was in passenger service, must have been some sort of, I want to say lounge observation car, but it, the, the, the takeaway for me, you know, 50 years later was these common pieces of equipment when we document them properly down the road are invaluable for hobbyists and modelers and so on and so forth. And I'm working closely with the family because, you know, it's possible that in Bob's notes, we might still have the, the drawing that he made on that occasion of this piece of equipment. Cause I'd certainly like to, uh, certainly like to see it. It, it taught me a lot about rail fanning and, what was important and what to document and what to look for and you know what what a discerning eye picks up like bob had here's a picture of the other side of the car and we can see that the the top of the car on this side and the top of the car on this side sure don't look the same and we can also notice that it has a window in the end which makes us think that it was some sort of observation car when it was back in passenger service at one time and being Bob, you know, he's extremely good at documenting these detail elements of the of this particular piece of equipment. So I'm not quite sure how I guess you climb up and then you try to I don't know. I there's a number of elements of this car that I don't really fully understand. And that's what makes it so fascinating is the parts that we don't understand are as interesting as the parts that we do. And here's a picture of the other end of the car. And we can see here that these windows have been blacked out. So not again, quite sure of all the details of this particular piece of equipment, but it's certainly a fascinating piece of equipment. And one that I was as, th as thrilled as any picture to be able to find these because it brought back memories of that day. Because I was like, I want to go over and take pictures of the BN. And, and Bob is like, no, we need to get measurements of this thing. And so in the middle of this busy art, here we are, a bunch of kids with Bob, tape measured in hand, measuring this car up. It was a, really a sort of a quintessential family memory of rail fanning with Bob. Now I'm going to take a break from the Milwaukee road just for a second, because, you know, Bob took some pictures of some steam locomotives that have been in the news recently. And I just want to just touch on these briefly. This Heisler locomotive, and it has a very interesting detail here, which we don't see in this photograph, uh, was a switcher at a tie plant at Hilliard. So it was in some way adjacent to the great Northern Hilliard yard. And here we see it under steam in 1958 in North Spokane. And here this locomotive is today being restored in Snoqualmie, Washington. And I double checked with someone that would know. And that person confirmed to me that these are in fact the same locomotive. And I'm, I'm quite comfortable with, with what I was told. Um, and you can kind of see here how this has been, these have been cut off and somehow that was this contraption here because they would push these these little cars full of ties into I guess the creosote machine the other one that was quite interesting and we just saw a picture of this this week taken by Jim Fredrickson at one of our PNRA bi-weekly meetings of the 924 out in Millwood so the 924 was Inland Empire Paper Company formerly Northern Pacific 924. And in the picture that Jim Fredrickson had, he had this metal can over the smokestack too. Uh, but I believe that at this point in time, this locomotive was still active and serviceable because the tender is full of coal. So here that locomotive is today. This locomotive resumed service in, I believe, October of 2020. 
again out at Snoqualmie, this is a picture by yours truly, but I just wanted to be able to show you that pictures that Bob took of locomotives many years ago, these locomotives have continued to survive. And the only change is instead of a rolly cord, now today's ph photographer is using an iPhone. So anyway, just a couple of pictures that Bob had that of, of trains that are uh, steam locomotives that are still running, still in service. Bob spent most of his life and most of his career in the Inland Empire, but he did live for a little while in Bellingham, Washington. That's where Roy and I and Mike Johnson and some of the other people here that know Bob, but you know, the, the Bellingham part of the contingency today met Bob here in Bellingham. And so we're going to take a look at some of Bob's Bellingham pictures. We, we won't have time to look at the Tacoma stuff today or some of the other just zillions of pictures that he took that we have available to us. But we will take a look at these Bellingham shots because they're really good and they really do an excellent job of explaining what we've got in Bellingham. Starting out with this color shot of a U30C or U33C, the 8501 in the afternoon, sitting up by the engine terminal. Here was their maintenance of the way truck, that old Dodge, that thing was a reliable beast. So, you know, documenting the basics was something that Bob was exceptionally good at. This was something that to me was very unique to Bellingham, which were these, we called them slap boards. Now in this particular case, this board is red to this track right here. This is the Great Northern. And this is clear to this track in the foreground, which is the Milwaukee Road. So when the Milwaukee Road would come out of the north end of their yard in Bellingham, they would have to cross the Great Northern and they would have to throw this thing. Well, first they call the Great Northern Dispatcher. The Great Northern Dispatcher would give them permission. Then they would throw this thing. Then they would wait the requisite number of minutes and then they would proceed across the diamonds. And they had this at both the north end and the south end of the yard. And frankly, I just thought it was a great way for the Great Northern to keep tabs on what the Milwaukee was doing. So again, documenting these basic things was something that Bob was exceptionally good at. For quintessential photographs of Bellingham, it's hard to beat an SD9 on the turntable at the Milwaukee former Bellingham Bay and British Columbia Roundhouse in downtown Bellingham. I'm, I, I'm just gonna say it now, uh, this entire area has been completely obliterated. There is absolutely no remnant that there was ever a railroad in any way, shape or form here as of today. This is all just a big, giant, massive apartment building that's up on top of the bluff. So the pictures that we can see today, let's be grateful that we've got them. And Bob certainly did a good job mm -hmm. of taking a number of them. Here's another shot of the 533, this time on that turntable sand house roundhouse lead in another classic image i like this picture for a number of reasons so in the early 1970s right after the bn merger the milwaukee would run these u-boats from tacoma to bellingham and then the sd9s would run from bellingham to linden sumas and limestone junction and come back and that was an operational pattern that evolved fairly rapidly over the 10 years that they had through service uh, from Tacoma to Sumas. You know, also noteworthy is the uh, very much a Bellingham thing, these ore cars that serve the mine at uh, Limestone Junction. And of course, the part of this picture that is kind of is, I don't know, just quintessential Milwaukee, I guess, is here we're blocking this track, but the switch is thrown against us. So the presumption must be that these guys aren't going to be getting in his way anytime soon. 532 and SD9. Now you can see like the, we saw the one in Spokane had that full fuel tank. Now these only had the little short fuel tanks and no dynamic brakes. I thought that these were particularly well situated 
for serving on a branch line operation like the Bellingham operation was. They were gentle on the track because they weren't that heavy. They had good tractive effort and you weren't ever going very fast on the Bellingham branch. So there was no need for speed with any of these. And again, being Milwaukee Road, we see the same locomotives over and over again. Just a classic shot. Here's another beautiful shot of the 532 on the turntable in Bellingham. This probably be mid afternoon. You know, Bob is a great photographer, but when you've got great subject matter, all you got to do is just point the camera and let her go. This is to me just very classic shot on the turntable, sand house, Leopold Hotel in the background. We just catch an eye of the switch engine over here. Just a very classic Bellingham kind of photograph. And the 531 on the other side of that, that turntable and they would roll these things into the roundhouse and service them in there. They had a little shop for us up in Bellingham. And, and uh, um, I remember uh, my late friend, Al Courier and Al said, you know, the people at the Milwaukee were just more friendly than the people on the BN. And pictures like this in the roundhouse, you know, it brings back those fond memories. They were really nice guys. And this was a really sort of a neat kind of special isolated operation for the railroad. Here's a picture of the 532 taking a spin on the turntable because we can see on this end, we're not going anywhere because we're not on the track. So he must be getting ready to either back into the roundhouse or he's just come out of the roundhouse onto the turntable. And again, this locomotive is the right length to fit on the turntable that was already there. So again, a, a very well conceived situation. Uh, one time or another, this was San Juan pulp and then it was Puget Sound pulp and timber. And then one day it was Georgia Pacific and now it's, uh, now it's none of the above and all of this, virtually all of the stuff for the mill here has all been, is been removed and they're in the process, uh, the city is in the process of converting it for other uses. One important note, actually two things. First, this picture is taken from the Northern Pacific track, which was right next to the Milwaukee Road Roundhouse. So we're gonna look at that MP track in a little bit more detail. And then of course, the ubiquitous Himalayan giant blackberries, uh, which are an invasive non-native plant. The indigenous blackberries don't grow like that. Here's the 630, which was the switch engine. They would rotate these in about once every month or two and different ones would take turns up here in Bellingham classic picture of the roundhouse. You know, the roundhouse faced north. So it was difficult to get a good picture of the roundhouse during the day because you were always kind of looking into the sun. So when I mentioned the Northern Pacific, see, this is their track right here. And they were just a little bit higher in elevation at this location than the Milwaukee was. And then of course, there we go. These are the dormitories of Western Washington University. My son, was in Mathis for a couple of years when he attended Western. What a great picture. There's so many important elements here. 531 on the turntable, young Gary Dowler. So this would be 1971. Gary, you were eight years old in this picture. Beautiful picture of the roundhouse. This is the ramp track that ran down from the Bellingham Bay and British Columbia roundhouse down to the Milwaukee Road Yard that was built along the Tide Flats at a later date. The original yard was up here along Railroad Avenue and later on they built the Squalicum line and it built a yard down below. Here's a Northern Pacific trestle. So their track came along behind the depot or excuse me behind the roundhouse and came on this little trestle here and they crossed the Great Northern probably somewhere between three quarters and a mile south of where the Milwaukee Road crossed. The Northern Pacific crossed at a place called Seaholm Junction. And then the NP continued all the way down to Fairhaven. When the NP was built in 1902, Fairhaven was the center of industrial activity in what we now call Bellingham. Just a great shot. And I'm probably the only person in the world that says this is the most beautiful building that was ever built, but it was. This is a 
detail shot that Bob took of the Milwaukee Road Roundhouse in Bellingham. And a very knowledgeable friend of mine said, you know, between the pictures that I took and the pictures that Bob took, we now have a complete set of images for what this entire location looked like. And so it's possible for a modeler now to come back and be able to reconstruct what we've seen. Bob, again, very detail oriented, you know, catching how these buildings sort of mass together and what went with what. And this bump out must have been added at some time subsequent to the construction of the original structure. Here's a picture of the, this would be the southwest side of the building. We saw an earlier view of it. We have the sand house here. We have the Leopold Hotel. This being the most difficult of the pictures to get, this is the sort of the one that is was the missing link, which was what the back side of the building looked like. And I remember being with Bob on this picture and crawling through the bushes with him so that we could get back here and get a picture. And at the time, I kind of thought it was, why are we doing this? But, you know, as I look at this picture 50 years later, the answer is very clear. It's just such a cool picture. And this railing right here, again, that's at Northern Pacific. And you can see it's probably about six or eight feet higher than the Milwaukee line through here. Here's an inside view of that roundhouse. Those guys, you know, didn't have a lot of budget, but they did have a lot of heart. And they really did a good job of keeping their facility as limited as it was in the best shape possible. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of credit to a lot of people deservedly in the Milwaukee Road. Here is the eastern side of that same roundhouse structure. So we got a window detail. We've got our Northern Pacific right here. We've got the dorms up on Western. And then we've got something inside the roundhouse that the guys are working on. And we can see that at one time that there was another track that's no longer in service that would be, you know, heading back into the bushes as it were. You know, the sand house in Bellingham that the Milwaukee Road had, had had kind of had hard life. And one of the things that happened is it had a blowout where actually literally the side of the, the south side of the structure, I don't know what happened, um, blew out. And so they, you know, fixed it with what budget that they had, which was a tarp to keep the sand from getting wet and a couple of cables to keep the building from separating any further. So there's a number of important elements again in this photograph. This is the original Bellingham Bay and British Columbia main line that Pierre Cornwall built that actually went to Sumas. Here's our ubiquitous caboose we're going to look at in a minute. This is Railroad Avenue out here. And this was where the original Milwaukee Road, Bellingham Bay and British Columbia yard and passenger station was once upon a time. We're going to take a look at some U30Cs. These were the Milwaukee Road road power that in the early 19, you know, 1970, 1971, right after the merger would trundle back and forth between Bellingham and Tacoma with the freight. And then, like I say, the SD9s would take it from there. Well, that didn't last long. And pretty soon everything was running up to Sumas for better or for worse. And the 8,000, the 8,002, 8,001, the 8,001, the 8,003. There are not many of these. You've got the whole set here, I think. And it's always interesting in Milwaukee Road photographs to see how many of these hoses are, are intact because it seems like that that's a highly variable uh, situation, shall we say. Here's the builder's plate of this locomotive, February 1968, U30C. Maintenance instruction GEK 15729. So then they started running four axle General Electrics up to Bellingham. And here's the 6001. And now I think, I think that this is a U30C built into a U28 car body because I think the 6000s were U30Bs. Now, don't quote me, but this is my recollection from 50 years ago. And again, the 6001, and the 6001, and the 6006, the North End locomotive. 
and the 6006. Now this structure right here was the Milwaukee Road, for lack of a better word, freight house. And you can see that there is a whole string of boxcars here. This little shed was a tremendous source of revenue for the railroad as it was busy with people in forklifts loading freight cars day in and day out. So that was a, like I say, a very valuable source of revenue for the company. And here's the 8,002. Now you can see this one's got none of those little hoses here. So I don't know why one has one and none has, you know, the other has none. Um, in here, this is, you know, one of the, they're all good shots, but this one's even better than good. Bob climbed up probably on the caboose to get a little bit more altitude so that we can see the top of the roundhouse, we can see the campus, we get a good view of the locomotive, and that right there was Bob's car. So it's got all the elements in this photograph. And here's that same situation again with the string of these ubiquitous ore cars that served all the way up, I, I wanna say it was like 1979 before those finally, before they finally started trucking from the limestone junction down to the cement plant. But that was a, when that went, you know, you knew things were kind of coming to the end for the Milwaukee because that was an incredibly valuable source of revenue on this particular line of track. So here we see another picture of Bob actually right here in the foreground. But more importantly, we see a picture of the 8003 heading down the ramp track. Now this picture is taken from that Northern Pacific bridge. So this bridge continues north and is the eastern end of the Bellingham Bay and British Columbia Roundhouse. And we can just see a sliver of the western end of the Bellingham Bay and British Columbia Roundhouse. So that roundhouse fit right in this area. And here this, this power, this would probably be lunchtime, maybe a little after lunch, as this thing descends the ramp down to the yard to couple onto its train to proceed probably south to Tacoma. So, you know, I've looked at these pictures a number of times and, and little details pop out. I've looked at this picture 30 times and all of a sudden last night, I see this detail and I'm like, what the heck? Why is this guy standing here? Isn't that where the, the engineer sits? So why do I have somebody standing in front of the engineer as this thing rumbles down the hill? I have no idea. And here we can see the 8001 and 8003 working downhill towards the, the yard. Um, and again, this is that Northern Pacific trestle. This had been a, the city of Bellingham converted this into like a bike trail. But the last time I was up there, this is closed. So I don't know if it's closed because of COVID or it's closed because there's a structural problem with this NP trestle or what. But, but uh, it was certainly a good vantage point to be able to catch some Milwaukee action up and down the ramp track, which not a lot of people had a lot of success getting. I certainly didn't myself. Here's the 619. So after the road power went down to the yard to get onto their train, the yard power came back up the hill to the roundhouse. No trip to Bellingham would be complete without a photograph of the 01608, a caboose that served dutifully in yard service all the way up to the end. I think someone told me that finally it got involved in an accident and came to, it had some problems, but um, a, classic, a classic caboose. And, you know, the Milwaukee did not have very many cupola cabooses. So this one is, you know, one of the more unique ones. I think we've got one other one in this presentation. This is not a caboose presentation. This is a classic Bellingham picture, if there ever was one. The 619 and the 01608. The Milwaukee Road needed to change the numbering system on their cabooses because uh, the, you know, they always put a zero in front of their cabooses, but um, data processing equipment couldn't recognize a zero as a lead character in a string of numbers. So they had to change that to 99. And so when we see that change, that also indicates to us the 
adoption or adapt, adapting to the needs of data processing equipment as the Milwaukee Road began to implement it. Uh, we'll see this caboose in a couple other locations, like right here with the 630. So the Milwaukee Road mainline to Sumas is over here. This is the north end of the yard. And this track diverted from the yard crosses Cornwall Avenue, which is just right out here on a 90 degree angle, and then crossed the Great Northern on a 90 degree angle to a siding that the Milwaukee Road served inside the Georgia Pacific plant. Now, I didn't see him serve that siding very often, but Bob caught him on this occasion, and it looks like to me that they're coming back from spotting a car because in this case, both the front and the head end brakemen are facing our direction. So I'm thinking he's coming our way. Another classic shot of Bob's of the 533 running solo through the yard with the crew posed for us. And of course, their really cool snowplow, which we've got a lot of neat pictures of for another presentation sitting in the yard. Oh, come on. Uh oh. Hmm. Like I'm stuck for a second here, folks. So hang on here. I'm trying to get the arrow key to work so I can go to the next image. That's weird. There we go. I'm sorry. Sorry for the delay. Here's the 533 rumbling through that Bellingham yard again. Columbia Valley Lumber, for those of us from Bellingham, that was bought by Georgia Pacific. So that is an outlet for their own building materials. Here's kind of a classic Milwaukee road shot. Look at these guys. Handsome couple up there on the back of the shove platform. Excuse me, it's not a shove platform, it's a caboose. And they are heading out to the cement plant to deliver a couple of cement hoppers out there. We'll see them here in a second. So um, very. this is the road that used to go to the yacht club. This has all been reconfigured. This is not the siding for Bellingham cold storage because it, it doesn't go all the way through. So the Bellingham cold storage siding is a little bit further north of this location. What a great shot. Here they are, this is Northwest Avenue. And it, yeah, I can't really tell, but this is Maury's drive-in. Maury's drive-in is still there. So they've come all the way out here to bring one car to load cement at the, the cement plant in Bellingham. And here they go. So they've, they come to here and then there's a switch. You can see the brakeman up here. And so now they're going to push uphill to the cement plant. And here they are starting to do that. So we're gonna leave them because here's the local coming up Squalicum Parkway. Squalicum Parkway was built in the early 1970s. And so this used to all be in the bushes. And so Bob gets a picture of the 533 and the 532, I believe, leading uh, the train for Sumas. And you can see, of course, that this is an intermodal train, right? I don't know, every once in a while in Steve's pictures and in Bob's picture here, we see some containers on flat cars on the Milwaukee road, but it, it, they're rare sightings. It's all I can say is we're just glad that we got to see what we did. Here the train is approaching Meridian Street in Bellingham. And crossing Meridian Street, this is Squalicum Creek here in the foreground. This has been remediated somewhat since then. Whoops, and that's the end of the Bellingham section. So now we're going back to Deer Lodge and looking at Deer Lodge in color. Some of these pictures might have been on the same day as some of the black and white images that we saw, but I didn't want to be jumping back and forth from color to black and white. So I put all the color stuff in a separate section. I believe this was August <clears throat> of 1973 and Bob and probably Ted and Norm spent the day out there looking for Milwaukee road trains. And I've got a couple of nice pictures of right away with no trains. So I think that they spent a whole day out here and this is all they were able to actually photograph was the action in and around Deer Lodge. And I believe that, well, I'd be guessing to say, but I, I think this is in the afternoon. And you know, these, I, I don't really need to say a lot. We can just kind of flip through them and just kind of enjoy them here for a second. 
the 3800 now i someone told me that that thing was on an extension cord and so here it is given the e21 a spin on the turntable as it backs into the roundhouse yeah here is the 3800 and we can see a a maintenance person here and we've got another little joe in a roundhouse here you know, so and Bob's got a number of pictures of the 3800. We could do a little presentation on it sometime. And it looks like to me that here in the foreground, this looks to be like an extension cord. So I'm not quite sure. You know, it's not like the weed whacker. If you ran over the extension cord with one of these things, you'd certainly notice. And here it is rolling back into the roundhouse on kind of a, you know, kind of a cloudy day, but you know, still a good day because we've got some Milwaukee Road pictures to take a look at. The 81 and the 82. Here's the 81 again. You know, Bob may have been using a tripod because I can see the lights are on here. So it's going to be either very early or very late in the day. The 82, it looks like it's kind of a windy day too from these flags. It looks like the wind's kind of blowing around. The sad E25A, uh, this isn't going anywhere anytime soon. I think you just need to figure out if it'll roll somewhere where they can dissemble it. No pantographs left. And this thing, the X900-208, which is a steam rotary plow. Um, gosh, it's sure a shame that this combination of equipment didn't get preserved. If it did, I don't know about it, uh, but it's a really cool looking you know, a steam rotary on an electric railroad. I mean, that's that's pretty neat with the full Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul and Pacific logo on there. The crane, the X-10, unfortunately this thing was getting used way too much by that point in time and I'll, I'll just leave it at that. These are very interesting and we're gonna take a look at a couple of these and I'm gonna kind of drill into these for a minute. I believe that these were baggage combine coaches that were used for branch line operations uh, where they had like mixed train services. And the railroad, um, to their credit, realized the functional value that these particular cars had. And so after they went out of passenger service, they put them right into maintenance of the way service. And I probably have seen a half a dozen of these. And so there's some number of important spotting features. I just want to take a minute and share with you. First, they put a piece of steel where the baggage door used to be and they welted it shut and they put this window in here. Now these windows are all square windows and you go, well, yeah, okay. Um, and it's a rib side car and it has this fairly cool ladder up the side for what purpose, I don't know. And the purpose of these tanks, again, I don't know, but it is riding on passenger trucks. So it's a very, very cool piece of equipment and I'm glad Bob spotted it for us. Here's the sand tower again in um, Deer Lodge with the sand car there. I think the only other thing that they got a picture of on this entire day's trip to Montana was the Sperry Rail Service number 125. And they took a picture of this and it looks like in the rain at Alberton, either on their way to Deer Lodge or on their way back. Yes. So in 1974, Mike Johnson, who's on this call and Steve Dixon and I went over to see Bob. And we had a day, Carol wanted to make dinner for us. So we needed to be home, but we had a day. And so we went down to St. Mary's to see what was going on. And we brought, brought Gary Dowler with us too. Gary would be 10 or 11 years old. I was in my father's Volkswagen Beetle. And so I had me and Steve in the front seat, Mike Johnson and Bob in the back seat, and Gary was riding in the boot behind the back seat, between the back seat and the window. So we stopped by the St. Mary's Depot. This is Bob's photograph of the St. Mary's Depot. And the operator said, there's nothing until this afternoon. It's just dead. We've got one eastbound late this afternoon and that's it. But we do have a train. The local is coming back from Beauville. It, it should be here in a couple hours. And so I thought, well, you know, it's 
we're, we're, we got nothing else to do. Um, we need to be back for dinner. So let's see if we can go find this train coming back from Beauville. Well, we never found the train coming back from Beauville, but we did find the Milwaukee Road Depot at Fernwood. And here's a picture of that. This would be in March of 1974. So I don't know how many pictures of the Fernwood Depot there are, but I'm really glad that we were able to get these. And here we are. This is me, this is Mike Johnson, and this is our friend Steve Dixon, wondering why he's gotten drug out to Fernwood, Idaho. So we ended up going from Fernwood down to Beauville, still couldn't find the train, drove all the way back to St. Mary's, still couldn't find the train and headed home. It was a complete disaster. We spent an entire day, we came from Bellingham all the way to Spokane, spent a day on the Milwaukee Road, and all we got is a picture of the Fernwood Depot. Needless to say, there was much rejoicing when we caught that eastbound freight, just like the operator at St. Mary's had told us. And it's funny, this is Bob's picture. I have a picture of this and Gary has a picture of this too. Just sort of the level of excitement to know that after a day of train spotting on the Milwaukee, we didn't get skunked after all. And here's a little bit closer view of that same image. Single unit on the point with some mid-train helpers heading east. So we hustled back to St. Mary's. Here's a picture of the 25, the lead unit, and I, their numbering series, this indicates that like it's a master or something, I don't know. Um, and a couple of mid trains, the 30 and the 3011, and we can see it's a beautiful day in, Mon in Idaho because it's been raining all day. And then our second trip to St. Mary's, and here's the local power for the Bullville train after all. So it finally came back and we finally were able to spot it. These were fairly new locomotives at, at that time. This would be 1974. And these are very cool and very sort of appropriate kind of Milwaukee Road branch line power. You know, no dynamics, reduced fuel tank. Um, you know, I'll show you one more picture here in a second. Here's the nose of the 351. Here's the, the B end, the long end of the 355. And just to show you branch line power, they equipped it with a snow plow on the long end of the locomotive. Now here we can see this is all looks pretty good, but this one on the back has already got some dents. So I think that the trailing truck must have bounced off the track at some point in time. The atmospheric, very cool. St. Mary's Idaho yard. There's all kinds of neat spotting stuff here. This grain hopper, which we'll see is been damaged beyond repair and that's why it's sitting there. Spreader, steam tender, outside brace box cars converted to maintenance of the way purposes. A lot of cool stuff still exists in St. Mary's today with the St. Mary's Railroad. I think the St. Mary's Railroad structure probably covers about this part of the yard these days. And you know, even in 1974, life was not that good on the Milwaukee. And cars that, for whatever reason, needed to be dissembled and cut up into pieces and converted into scrap would accumulate here. And here Bob has taken a picture of accumulated a bunch of uh, trucks and stuff. And we can also see that we have an empty case of Miller High Life back there in the bushes as well. You know, Bob really had a discerning eye. Here's that hopper I was mentioning to you that was damaged beyond repair. And this is the St. Mary's yard switcher. But interestingly, they built a three-way switch in St. Mary's. And you would think out here, you wouldn't need to build something like that, but they did. And it's a really cool spotting feature. And of course, our friend Bob doesn't miss these things with that sharp eye of his and caught this and was able to record it for our enjoyment today. Now, interestingly, here's another one of those kind of combine cars. And you can see that there's a number of different spotting features on this car than the one that we just saw over in Deer Lodge a minute or two ago. Again, they welded the baggage door shut, but in this case, they had a different window configuration. There's no ladder 
like the 415 had. And these windows all have a curve at the top. And of course, the most significant difference is that this is a smooth side car. And the car that we saw in Deer Lodge, the 415 was a rib side car. So these are very neat cars. And I, there's something that I, I want to get to know more about myself. Here's another picture of the other side of that car. Again, showing you some of the details of that. It's a very interesting piece of equipment. And I, I, I doubt that one of these got saved, but they would have certainly been a neat piece of equipment. And these could have worked well on a short line or a, you know, one of these steam tourist railroads, or they could have worked in all kinds of different situations. Still riding on passenger trucks. The crane, this thing had just come back from its latest mission. It just ridden hard, put away wet, and probably wasn't going to be long before it went back into service again. To me, you know, I'm not an expert on this, but to me, this looks like a flat car on a flat car because this looks like the profile of a flat car on a flat car. And I believe that this was a, that was used in the maintenance of the catenary system. So how this car could end up in St. Mary's, I'm wondering if it's no longer being used for that sort of service and was in the process of, of demising or exactly what happened. Now it looks like, that there's like a gear here. So I'm wondering if this thing could have possibly pivoted on this point and swung one way or another. I just don't know. So if we know anything about the X195, you know, I'd be interested. I'm sure the group would be interested in knowing more about this car. So let us know what you know. Then um, they have this plow and this plow is still at St. Mary's today, I believe. Uh, you can see that the coupler can move and is a control here so that when they're out plowing that they can you know do it how they want to. Here's a really great picture that Bob took of that particular piece of equipment and I certainly hope one way or another that this piece of equipment gets preserved. I know it would look fantastic at South Lake South Clay Elm, excuse me. And here's the sort of the B end of that piece of equipment. So we know that Bob took pictures of the Milwaukee Road in Montana in the 1950s, but we don't have a lot of them available for today's presentation. But I can show you this one that was taken in Alberton in 1958. As a segue into the trip that Bob and Norm and, and probably Ted Holloway took in the spring of uh, 1973, uh, to Montana to see, or excuse me, yeah, 73, to see what they could still get while, you know, time was of the essence to photograph as much of the Milwaukee Road as possible. Here we are at Haugen. And here we are looking the other way at Haugen. Um, you know, the Milwaukee Road signals were lit all the time. So a green block um, was not a good sign. That meant that there was nothing coming. So. So these guys persevered and, and, and kept going. Here's the substation. This isn't at Haugen, I forget where this is, um, but it's on the way. And they caught a train. Now, again, I've tried my best to get these into the best order that I can. And I apologize if I don't have them perfect, but he got this train and this would be just east of Alberton, I believe. And here's another shot of it, two little Joes couple of uh, EMDs, perfect light, winter lighting, what more could you ask for? And here's another shot of it. And by this time, the, you know, the idea that the electrification could demise was starting to get some traction and people were starting to take notice of it. And so you would get more and more people out taking pictures of the train because they were realizing that Time was of the essence to get these photographs, which in fact was the case. So here he is crossing the bridge, and then here's the going away shot of that. You know, Bob's roller cord wasn't a motor drive, and so you'd have to wind the manually wind the camera between each shot. So he'd need to give himself some latitude on these action sequences, as we'll see.
Both locomotives are going, both pantographs are up. Here we are at Alberton. Wow, gosh, I wish I would have been here on this day. This was such a cool deal. There's the train. And here is an eastbound freight getting ready to leave. But it was all diesels. So it did not garner much in the way of attention from the throng of people that we'll see. Here's a switchman as this train, the eastbound starts to leave town and this westbound picks up his crew and is gonna get going here in a second. And another picture of the E71. I'm not sure who these people are in the picture. I wish I knew. Um, so if you know, please let me know. But I think that this is just a fantastic shot at Alberton during the crew change before this thing gets on the road heading west. Here it is, it's gotten starting to head west and Bob got a shot of it and I'd have to look up the exact name of the location of this place. I, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you off the top of my head. And here he got another shot of him again. And here's another shot of him, what a great shot. Bob was such a good photographer. And here, you know, the, he, he got the people in the picture. And I think in a lot of ways, it makes it for a very interesting photograph with the people in the picture. So this is a really cool bridge. And it's important to note that, that we have an artifact from this bridge. Gary was here a couple of years ago and there was still a chunk of this pole in the ground. And so he gave it a little tug and it pulled out of the ground. So Bob, or excuse me, Gary has, a hunk of this pole in his garage is an artifact of the electrification of the Milwaukee Road. So I mentioned that Bob, you know, didn't have a motor drive on his roller cord camera. So when it came time to take an action picture, you pretty much got one shot. And I'd say on this particular occasion, Bob nailed it about as good as it can be gotten. I think this is just a perfect shot at this location. Afternoon light, Everything is going great. What a, what a deal. And here's the going away shot at the same location. So those of us that know the family that are out there at this presentation today, if you could let me know if this is Bob's car or Ted's car or Norm's car or whose car this was, I think it would add to the total satisfaction of this image. So here they are crossing the big bridge. And Bob shot this a little early, and I'll show you why here in a second. Here's a kind of a close up of that location. Um, you know, what a, what a great day. Wow, so cool. See, he needed to be in a hurry to get this because he also wanted to get this and give himself time to wind and get in position to get this shot, which I think is just a classic shot at this location. And then here's the going away shot at that location as well late in the afternoon, in March of 73, 74. So very good stuff. And here is the final shot on that particular trip on this occasion. As you can see, it's starting to get dark in the afternoon and they're still a ways away from Spokane and still need to drive home that night. Now we're into the Avery shot. So we're sort of coming to the end of the presentation. You know, it wouldn't be, I think that, well, from my perspective, the the culmination of Bob's photography is press, expressed in Avery, Idaho, which is sort of the, the Xanadu of the Milwaukee Road, I think, in some respects. So here is a picture of the roundhouse. This is looking east in early in the day. And we can see, you know, off here where this yellow car is, um, orange car, whatever color that is, uh, that's where those steam engines were parked in 1951. And so we can see in 20 years that there's been a fair amount of evolution to the Milwaukee Road, at least here in Avery. And like I say, the steam engines were parked right where this thing, the X915679 is parked. And I'm not quite sure what the purpose of this particular piece of equipment was. It looks like it must have been used for maintenance purposes on the electrification. You know, the other thing is the campers in the campgrounds, because a lot of people that work for the railroad would bring their campers or, or camping equipment up here. And then since this was a crew change, they 
could possibly, you know, lay over in their camper and then work the next train. Uh, I know when we were here in 1973, uh, my visit, we got there, we had no place to stay. And so the guy that was driving the car talked to one of the crewmen and we stayed in one of their campers. So it's, uh, it was a nice place to camp and, and Avery, for those of us that have been there is, is truly a magical location. A couple of GE or a couple of little Joes, excuse me, at the engine house. These were all, um, I believe, May 28th of 1973. Yes, E21 next to the sand car. And the electric rotary snowplow, the X900-212. And the other end of the X900-212. Very nice picture of a very unique piece of equipment. I think this is the X900-214 that Bob got a picture of inside the Roundhouse at Avery, you know, one of my friends always says, oh, I like those, those pictures inside the Roundhouse. They're so atmospheric and this one certainly is. So as best I can, I'm trying to recreate the circumstances that occurred on this particular day, because I think it was a unique day is what from people tell me. So we start out now with a pair of box cabs sitting on the siding by the Avery Depot. This is the Avery Depot and lunchroom. And, you know, just kind of rumor control, rumor central for what was going on on the railroad. Here they are again, E78. So here the train is bringing a cut of cars up. It's crossing over from the siding. So I think what they've done is they back down, coupled onto this train and are pulling this train up the main line now, up to the depot. And we can see that you know, by this point in time, more people were interested in what was going on in Avery, and you could get quite a crowd here here on a on a nice summer day, summery kind of day. And here's the seventy eight, and again. So then, a train that was all SD forties came up subsequently and passed this train of Little Joes. Change crews, 3017 on the point. And then this thing took off. And, and now what was sort of happening as we got towards the end of electrification is we start seeing more and more of these solid diesel trains and fewer and fewer with little Joes on them. And here this train goes up, upstream towards the pass. So then they brought the E21 and the other one that we saw down at the roundhouse earlier up and parked it next to the E78. And here we go. So here's a train heading up the pass. Pair of little Joes on the point. Yes, and they're both got their pantographs up. So we got two little Joes running here. And here along the St. Joe River, which is, which is a very lovely body of water. It's just pristine. And this is incredibly unique. This might be the money shot of the day, folks, because we don't get very many pictures of Little Joes as mid-train helpers on the train. Uh, now, one of my friends in Montana pointed out to me that this locomotive does not have its pantographs up. This one does. So this one's actually functioning as a mid train. And this one is probably tagging along on its way to Deer Lodge for some sort of maintenance purpose. So like I say, we just don't see very many pictures of Little Joe's operating as mid train helpers. This is, there was maybe a couple of instances of this at all. And of course, you know, you have to throw one of these pictures into the mix sad pictures of struggle and failure and trying to, the valiant effort that they, they tried to make. The next time Bob was in Avery, he caught a couple of GEs on a work train. So they were trying, they, you know, with what money they had, they did the maintenance that they could. The 5511 and the 5006, here we are looking across the St. Joe River. You could just about 
walk from stone to stone over the river at that point in time. So quiet and pristine. You could see the fish swimming around down in there. And here it is from that little overpass in Avery with a couple cars full of cross ties going to go up there and do some work. Here, Bob noted the X251. This looks like a composite spreader. This looks com composite to me. Uh, a vintage piece of equipment with a stock car next to it. Um, you know, we, we're, we're still looking for Bob's. We have hundreds of pictures of Milwaukee Road cabooses and 10 pictures of Milwaukee Road freight cars. So we think that we've got more collection yet to find, yet to provide at some future date to those interested. Here are the 992-254 with a little portable uh, burrow crane or whatever kind of crane you want to call that. Again, in this, this uh, work train and they were going to go up on the pass and work. Here's the 991-611, another one of those fairly rare Milwaukee Road cupola cabooses. Classic photo, and here's a second shot of that, I believe on the same day. Um, you know, uh, works well as a maintenance of the way. And the 331 was uh, spotted in Avery on that day too. This one happens to have dynamic brakes. Here we have a little Joe coming out of the engine house. So this is Norm and Carol. And like Carol, like I said, she liked trains just as much as the boys did. And, uh, and, and I'm glad that she did because we would not have been able to take the pictures that we did if it were not for her kind indulgence of us. Like I say, she treated me like a mom. She was a real dear. So here this thing comes out and it's rolling out onto the turntable. Uh, and there's Norm checking us out. And here this thing takes a spin on the turntable. Here's the E45. I believe it was the last set of operating box cabs. In a piece of maintenance equipment, it looks like it must, this must extend and must have been used for working on the catenary, I'm guessing, seen inside the roundhouse. Here's the E78 with an eastbound freight having arrived at Avery. Another picture of it here arriving at Avery. Okay, Mike, Mike Johnson, you need to pay attention. You're going to show up here in a second. Here's the E21. This was a trip that that uh, Mike Johnson and I for sure were on. I think Roy might have been here. I don't think Steve was, you know, and we went out here. Just a beautiful day. Look at this late in the afternoon. Just great. There you are, Mike. Yeah, with the E21. So fond memories. Sure glad that we got there. But going there with Bob makes it more fun. Another I asked the engineer on that E21 for a ride up to the depot. Said no, but that's the way it went. Well, you know, I actually got a chance to ride around in one and, uh, and, they're just so interesting because even when they're working, they just kind of make that whirring noise. You know, they could be working in notch eight and they make the same whirring noise that they make when they're idling. Yeah, they're very, very cool. They're, they were special. Thankfully, the E70 got preserved at Deer Lodge. Here's the 79. Here's young Gary Dowler checking out the B end of the 79, beautiful afternoon. I wonder about that picture. And Mike Johnson, here you are again, Mike. Another picture admiring the 77. So we were glad to have you along on that trip as we were to have you along on all the trips that you came on with us. So I looked at this picture last night. I've seen this picture. This is one of the first pictures of Bob's color stuff that we were able to identify. And of course, it's a fantastic picture of G young Gary Dowler. Gary, you'd have been, this would be 73, so you'd be, I think, 10 years old. But what I didn't notice until last night, and I looked at this picture, like I say, umpteen million times, Gary is holding my camera bag. <laughs> I can't believe it. I can't believe I didn't see that previous to this. You can see that all the little mementos 
that were on these locomotives were starting to disappear by this point and ended up in somebody's garage or basement. Here are the 77, I believe it takes a spin on the turntable and again, just a gorgeous day, you know, a day of great memories. And here it now the, so the panographs down here or is actually in the process of extending here. And here the panograph is fully extended. You can see it pressing up against the wire. Classic shot, what a beautiful place. You know, I mean, it was a really cool place for trains as we all know, but it was just a really cool place on general principles too. And when you add the two together, you end up with, you know, three. One and one is three in this case. Another picture that we use for one of the cover shots, just a classic picture. Sadly, here is a westbound freight came over the hill no electric help in 1973. The crew with, uh, is this a radio telephone here? Um, getting ready to depart here. Our crew person is getting on board as this thing gets ready to, to head out of town west. Now folks, don't try this at home, okay? So I think Bob climbed up on possibly the sand tower to be able to get a little bit of elevation to be able to get this classic shot. I mean, of all the ones, again, this would be one of the ones that really stands out to me is just for composition and, and, and just being kind of neat. This picture was, uh, this is part of the trip from September 30th of 1973. We've got this trip, and then we've got one left, and then today's presentation will be coming to an end. Here's another picture inside the engine house of a little Joe. I mean, it's just so timeless, you know, and like I say, it's just, it's just all dirt and weeds out there now. Another great picture down below, brand new Milwaukee Road covered hoppers. I mean, we, we were valiant. We tried. Sand everywhere. You know, you'd come home and your mother would be so mad at me tracking all this dirt over the house because this all be caked with oil. And <sighs> so. I, you know, they just pictures worth a thousand words in some of these cases. The yard with a bunch of General Electrics and, you know, a box cab and a little Joe. Here's a set of box caps again. I think that they kept them, but they didn't, by this time, 73, 74, they didn't get out very often. Here's the 175 on an arriving eastbound freight. Here we got another picture of it. We're starting to get some fall color on the hills in the background in Avery. You know, that's a beautiful time of year in Montana, excuse me, Idaho. And uh, brand new box car, you know, um, and Bob usually was better than this. Bob usually would take a picture of the old ones and not the new ones. But in this case, that shiny, fresh paint, he just couldn't resist it. be able to see it. Here's an arriving E77 with a, uh, uh, um, a westbound train. The 75 at the depot, with the crewman waiting couple pictures here of the 75 with the lunchroom. For those of us that have been to the lunchroom, that was sure a fun place. You know, that one and the one in Wish Room were both uh, pretty fun places to grab a bite to eat and you listen to the people passing the time and talking about this and that. You'd hang on every word. Again, here we are. So we must be getting late in the day. We're getting some lights on at the depot. And Bob, you know, a lot of steam guys like this low angle looking up on the locomotive. I certainly do. Makes for a neat shot. And here we are coupling on to the train, our helper E75 under the point of the 3027. And here we go heading up the hill. You can see we've been trying. We've done some fresh ballasting. We've done some tie work. You know, maybe that work train that we saw earlier, you know, might have been up here working. So. Wow, right along the St. Joe River. Classic shot. And I don't think that we would be doing this now in September 
which is burning old cross ties along the right of way. I don't think that people would go for that anymore. And, but, you know, at this particular point in time, it was a uh, fair game. And, and we had a lot of uh, nice fresh white ballast to run our train over. Here's the 3027 on an arriving westbound trio of SD40 2s. Substation at, at Avery. Why we couldn't have saved this? You know, I'm so glad Paul, all the effort at Cascade Rail Foundation has gone through to preserve the substation at South Clay Elm. And I look at buildings like this and I'm so grateful for the work that you guys have done. Support Cascade Rail Foundation and making that park a reality, folks. Bob got a nice detailed picture of some of the electrical connections in here. I remember being inside of this building during a rainstorm in 1973. It just, it's just, it, it, it's so cool. It was just so much fun. Here we have a set of power um, heading um, west. So the Little Joes, um, there was a pair of them and I don't see that, well, here they are going underneath the bridge and with a string of uh, General Electric's behind them. So, you know, we have a problem in this photograph in that these little Joes are gonna cut off and end up at the roundhouse. And this string of General Electric's needs to continue westbound, but the ones on the west end are long end first. The E20 at the sand tower. I think that's you, Gary. Gary Dowler, E20 at the sand house. Again, just kind of a classic day, folks. Very nice picture of the yard. You know, we're coming to the end. This is early 1974 now. This is May of 1974. So the end times are upon us for the electrification. This was where we saw those steam engines. This is where that house was with the Victory Garden. And by now, 1974, it's just a uh, extremely atmospheric scene, in my mind. In the electric house. And Gary, I think you're looking for something here. I'm not quite sure what. So then they started uh, heading for home from Avery at the end of a long day and caught this eastbound diesel freight at Calder. You know, you don't, you concentrate on getting the pictures of the electrics and sometimes you don't always focus on getting a picture of the gap. And so they figured out how to switch one of those U-boats, put it on the point. And here's that train right at sunset, heading westbound now, we're past Avery, heading towards St. Mary's. And Please support the Cascade Rail Foundation in their efforts to repair the 5057. Folks, I thank you so much for your time today. You know, it's 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 been a goal of mine for the friends that know me, it's been a goal of mine for a long time to be able to share pictures that Bob Dollar took with you. And and thank you. I've I've completed my project. This is the end of our presentation. And I thank everybody for your time and effort and attention and and I hope some people will get a chance to realize, you know, we can't realize what a great guy Bob was anymore, but we can certainly realize what a great photographer Bob was. And I thank everybody for their time and attention today. And at this point, Paul, I'm going to turn the conversation back over to you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jonathan. Really appreciate all the work that you and the family have done to gather these photos and, and uh, share them with us today. Um, and... Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure. Excited to see what other little treasures that are in that collection that uh, you've been scanning that uh, could help people in the future. Um, I think we got most of the questions in the chat answered in the chat. Um, if we missed one, uh, please uh, let us know. Um, and if uh, you're having trouble with chat, let, you know, Bob, if you have any comments or questions, uh, you can unmute at this time to to uh, chime in. Hello, this is Bob Butler again. I got a couple of quick comments. 
the X195 was in fact a pile driver. You would rotate it up to a vertical position and then you could tilt it left or right to get the proper canter for your bents for the pile trestles. So, so then they would have used that for like when they needed to replace a pole to support the catenary and stuff like that then? No, that was too far out. It was oh. for bridges. Oh, okay. Well, thank yeah. you. Okay. And then this one of the 1600 series cabooses ended up as a general manager of Lines West business car, but he had to do the conversion himself. They wouldn't provide them with one out of the pool service at Milwaukee. So is, does that car still exist? And if so, where is it? That I don't know. Okay. Well, thank you, though, for the information. Yeah. And one more final comment. Many of those branch line cars ended up in wrecker train service. It's where they could get out of the rain when you're out in the middle of nowhere. Sometimes they could provide at least light meals to the record crews. Right. Yeah. Those were, um, yeah. I don't know that any of those got saved because those, those were sure cool little cars. I thought, you know, yeah. very Peter, much uniquely Milwaukee. Yeah. The reader railroad down in Arkansas had one or two of them, but that was way back in the sixties. I don't know what happened to those cars. Well, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. This is uh, Mike Johnson. I couldn't get the chat to work, but when you were showing the switch engine at Bellingham, I just thought of in when I was 13 years old, I got my first cab ride in an engine in one of those switchers. It was a 629. Well, Mike, I'm sure glad that you were here. and You could enjoy seeing a couple of pictures of yourself, right? Yeah, it was. Uh, I do remember those uh, that that particular trip where we went, it was on a Saturday, I think, and we were afraid that you know, the roads were closed, a lot of them because there was such a fire danger. It had been a mm -hmm. very dry summer and, mm -hmm. and um, but Bob found out that they the road to Avery was open because it was the only road in. Right. We were able to go. And it was, uh, yeah, I remember that. Um, and I also remember we stopped at St. Mary's and took some old gauges off one of that box that box cap set that was there and 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 i got stung by a yellow jacket and but it was a good time yeah you know i got one of those gauges and i've donated it to cascade rail foundation so that they've actually got a a uh, a gauge out of one of those box caps we we had fun climbing over those things like they were monkey bars yeah, I finally gave mine away to a friend, and I don't know where it has gone. I hopefully it it went to a museum or something. But uh, it's, yeah, well, you know, we're not going to get a new one. Yeah, that's true. It, it doesn't seem like it's almost fifty years ago, but it was. Yeah, sure was, wasn't it? Yeah. So, Jonathan, this is yeah. Tony Dell, and I'd like to thank you first of all for the presentation. Um, I wanted to add on the notes about the. Um, uh, the general manager's caboose, that it did make it uh, past the merger into Sioux Line service and was painted uh, into Sioux Line paint. I don't know what happened to it after that, um, but uh, I do know that it lasted at least until the mid to late 80s. And uh, I made a comment about the potlatch plow um, and that it was, uh, I, I remember in uh, Robert Olmsted's book, I think Milwaukee Rails, that there were no official drawings of that uh, plow in the Milwaukee archives or in the in the engineering drawings. And I happened upon a website someplace that uh, had pictures of plows that were used by Potlatch Forest Industries. Mm. And um, they were wooden plows, but very obviously were the pattern that the Milwaukee used to make the Potlatch plow. And um, I tried to figure out a way to, to put the pictures in the chat and I couldn't do that. But if, if anybody's interested, I'd um, be delighted to share my screen and, and uh, put those pictures up for people to see if they'd like to look at them. Well, I'll leave that up to our moderator. Go ahead, Tony, you can pop them up there for a minute. All right, let me, uh, let me see here. Uh, 
I'm gonna uh, hang on here. Let me stop sharing. There we go. Okay. So that's uh, that's one view. And um, let's see if I can figure out how I've got three different. Okay. Is that the one I just showed? It is, isn't it? Yeah, Bob actually has some pictures of these too. We had a trip sure. that, yeah, there you go. We, we had a trip down there in 1975 and they were just outside the scope of today's presentation. But, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure glad that you're sharing these with us. Yeah, I, I always thought that it was pretty interesting how uh, remarkably similar the Milwaukee um, potlatch plow was to these plows and how obviously uh, the Milwaukee took what they thought was a good idea and uh, put their own spin on it. And uh, obviously that plow is, uh, I, I don't know how often it's been used recently, but it still lives. So uh, the concept- Where, where uh, is it? Where is I, it, the potlatch plow? Yeah. It's still in St. Mary's. Oh, oh, oh okay, 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 yeah. got it, got it, okay. Yeah, the Milwaukee one. Right, the Milwaukee one, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and I do agree with everybody else that that's definitely a piece of equipment that needs to be preserved. Sure look nice at South Clay Ellen, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck with the owner. Yeah. So. so thank you very much for, for sharing today. I know we all really appreciate it. Yes, we surely do. Well, like I say, I mean, this was, you know, this took a few years to, to, to actually get this off the ground. And, and as I've said uh, for a long time, I've been waiting for today for a long time. And the idea that everybody would get a chance to see, you know, just what a great photographer Bob was. And he was just such a neat guy. And, and he's got a special place in my heart. And hopefully these pictures allow you to kind of see my, my feelings for my friend. Well, speaking for myself and hopefully for everybody else, I look forward to Bob 2, the sequel. <laughs> you know, I, I mentioned briefly the movies <laughs> and we don't know what we've got in these movies. Now, I saw one reel of film that said Avery, August 1961. So, mm -hmm. but we think that, we think that um, the bulk of it, the big stuff, uh, the 16 millimeter stuff might be like Rainier steam or something like that. So um, it's uh, one of my friends has helped arrange for it to get uh, digitalized. And, um, you know, when the spirits move, you know, that could be some, you know, potentially really exciting stuff. And we're not done, you know, looking for Bob's collection. Like I said, during my presentation, you know, we look, why do we have 140 NP steam pictures and two great Northern steam pictures? And so we start looking and we find things that were even more interesting than the stuff that we were looking for. Like I've got a box of, of Rock Island BL2s in 1960, switching in Chicago which obviously is not germane to today's presentation, but there's lots of neat stuff left to, left to share from Bob's collection. And, and I'm so grateful to the family for all of their help and support to make this happen. I mean, they're the ones that deserve the credit. <laughs>